So our next speaker is, uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Professor Saad Al Saleh, uh, who is an otolaryngologist and uh, head and neck surgeon in uh, Saudi Arabia. He's gonna join us virtually. Um, we both have uh, some shared experiences. He spent five years of his training in the uh, University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, which is where I also did my training. So I'm sure we could commiserate about some of the weather issues uh, in Winnipeg. He went on to do a fellowship in uh, rhinology and basal skull surgery uh, at University of British Columbia in Vancouver. So uh, again, spent a lot of time in, in my uh, native land of Canada. He's won awards as a, a best teacher and best researcher award at the um, King Saud University Medical City in Saudi Arabia. So I'm, I'm sure he's gonna spend the next 20 minutes um, doing a great job of educating us on uh, changing treatment paradigms in chronic rhinosinusitis. So without further ado, I'll turn it over uh, to Dr. Al Saleh. Thank you, Dr. Seward. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if actually, is this uh, clear? Yeah. yeah. Is my voice clear? Yes, it's clear. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Zakouk. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Jamian. And uh, thank you, Chairman, for the uh, kind introduction. And it's really a pleasure and an honor to be among you, uh, just to talking about uh, chronic sinusitis, uh, focusing more on nasal polyposis and uh, the theme of this uh, great event at the first uh, Emirates Allergy uh, uh, Symposium. So these are, this is my disclosure. And we'll focus mostly about chronic sinusitis and it's a, a vast uh, subject and I'm glad to be part of the uh, European guidelines, the EPOS 2020. And it, it, it's basically a huge uh, paper on everything about sinusitis as well as rhinitis. And uh, when we define sinusitis or chronic sinusitis, it's basically presence of or without nasal polyps, inflammation of the nose and paranasal sinuses characterized by certain symptoms. And the four the symptoms that we always talk about are the nasal blockage, congestion, discharge, facial pain and pressure, and the reduction or loss of sense of smell for more than or equal to 12 weeks. And then we also see some evidence on endoscopy, either polyps, edema within the middle meatus, so within uh, the nasal cavity itself, or CT changes that uh, some of the allergologists or the pulmonologists can actually see as well. So if we see the CRS prevalence within, uh, within uh, countries worldwide, it's actually more prevalent than asthma. And it's approximately 12%, 10 to 15% in the majority of, of regions. And CRS with polyps approximately is half of that. So it's still pretty common to actually have that within your populations. And it's also a, a huge economic burden of around 20, 12 billion or so within the US. So it's a, it's a, it is a big uh, disease that we need to deal with. And the EPOS has done a great job in the, uh, in the last iteration in dividing primary uh, uh, sinusitis into localized or diffuse. Uh, localized is more of a surgical disease. Uh, sometimes it can be characterized by type two inflammation, which you've heard about as allergic fungal sinusitis or diffuse allergic fungal sinusitis within both uh, sides, along with CRS with polyps, is an aphilic uh, CRS without polyps, allergic fungal sinusitis, and uh, central compartment atopic disease, where they have disease within the central compartment of the, of the uh, sinusal cavity, and it's more of a severe allergic reaction. And I'm sure you've heard a lot about type two inflammation in the cell mediated immunity, so I won't talk a lot about it, but we know that the cytokines interleukin 4, 5, and 13 are the main uh, moderators of this type of inflammation, leading to xenophilic recruitment and inflammation, as well as increase in IgE. And this is just a, you know, uh, a, a summary of all uh, these type 2 inflammatory pathways within the chronic sinusitis groups that we see. And all of them, you actually see some sort of polyps or polypoid structures within the nose. So central compartment atopic disease on the left-hand side, aspirin respiratory respiratory disease in the middle right here with a lot of olfactory cleft uh, pulpoid changes, allergic fungal sinusitis with uh, double density signs and a lot of isenophilic mucin, so a, a thick, thick discharge within the, within the sinuses themselves, very common in the Middle East. So if we see uh, endotypes within, uh, within countries, we can actually see the majority of them are around in type two inflammation, while type one will be much less 
unless you're actually in Asia, and we'll talk about how uh, uh, xenophilic types in Asia as well, as well have been uh, more prominent at this point in time. And we've also seen that uh, within our population, we've actually just finished some data, preliminary data at, at King's University. We've uh, uh, seen 433 polyps and type two uh, inflammation within these polyps defined by a uh, xenophil count of more than 10 was 92%, so the highest worldwide. So, and we actually deal with, as a referral center with, uh, with multiple uh, uh, patients from multiple regions. So we can actually say that this is actually uh, a, a important step towards whether or not we need to endotype our patients with polyps. So this just uh, shows a, the xenophilic shift in uh, nasal polyps, even in Asia, as in the 1999 group, the, the uh, xenophil counts were much, much less compared to the 2011 group compared to probably right now as well. So what does that entail and what does type two uh, inflammation entails within the sinuses? It actually leads to a lot of uh, issues and uncontrolled sinusitis. And an overall revision rate is of, uh, around 18.6% of all sinusitis, but with higher risk groups, it actually goes up. And allergic fungal sinusitis is one is within uh, that group. Aspirin exposure to respiratory disease, asthmatic patients as well. So all of the severe type two inflammation, inflammatory pathways can actually lead to a difficult to control sinusitis uh, within our group. So how can you actually tell uh, type two inflammation within our uh, group of patients? And some of the predictors that are uh, clinical. And this is a nice uh, study from um, uh, Chicago, seeing the association between the endotypes uh, along with the clinical presentation of patients. And what they found in CRS with polyp uh, population, that the clinical parameters associated with type two endotypes were nasal polyps, which you expected, asthmatic patients as well, smell loss. So this is a one a big predictor of type two inflammation, as well as allergic mucin. So this thick uh, discharge that actually goes back in the throat and they actually sometimes feel small little pieces coming down the throat in some uh, cases similar to uh, uh, allergic fungal sinusitis. Another thing that the younger they are, they're mostly type two, the older they are presenting, then the possibility is more of a type one or a mixed uh, type reaction is there. And this has been seen in multiple studies as well. Uh, in terms of what can you do in terms of biomarkers, serum and tissue, well, in the serum, there's multiple uh, cytokines that can be tested, but mostly for research, and it's fairly difficult to do in clinical practice. Uh, in terms of the tissue xenophils as well, there was a, a big uh, controversy about how much xenophils within, this, uh, within the tissue themselves uh, can actually uh, define type 2 inflammation or a xenophilic reaction. And the EPOS actually agreed upon uh, the cut points of a tissue xenophil count of more than 10 per high power field, serum xenophils of more than 250 or 0.25 in your labs, an IG count of equal or more than 100 to actually uh, equalize uh, or to define uh, type 2 inflammation within the CRS with uh, nasal polyps. And the, these are the clinical kind of parameters that we talked about as well. And this can help you to predict uh, whether or not the patient is a type 2, uh, has type 2 inflammation. And the other thing about the uh, EPOS uh, uh, guidelines uh, as well shows you the care pathway of these patients. And you can, you can see that we start usually with appropriate medical therapy consi uh, consistent of nasal steroids, saline rinses, and uh, possibly consider uh, oral steroids or even antibiotics as well. And then if it didn't, if they didn't respond, they can actually think about typing the patient and uh, considering again, giving appropriate medical therapy uh, possibly surgery. However, in studies, uh, continued medical therapy was not really, was actually, uh, uh, was lower than uh, uh, considering endoscopic sinus surgery. And this was, sinus surgery was actually superior in terms of the quality of life, uh, quality of life scores, the nasal endoscopy scores, as well as improvements in olfaction, health utility scores, and even cost effectiveness of the, of the drugs being used, as well as the inter interventions. So the majority of times it's a combination of surgery along with medications, especially in these patients, lead to a better quality of life. And this is just, uh, also there's a lot of controversy on how much surgery is needed, and I won't bother you with that. Uh, however, this is a patient that actually had full sinus surgery on one side. This is allergic fungal sinusitis, and it's fairly clear. So it's four years or so after surgery, and she's been doing well. And this is the majority of patients. However, in, the, in some cases, that actually becomes a little bit uh, more difficult. So uh, 
something that you shouldn't be doing. And I've, we've seen this a lot in some patients where they basically remove portions of the middle turbinate, uh, do partial surgery, and the patients are actually much worse than what they were before. So they had a lot of scarring. They actually had, do much worse in terms of olfaction. They do much worse in terms of control and in terms of drugs, as well as, uh, uh, as, well as the uh, quality of life scores. So we sometimes think about aggressive surgery, and this is a draft three type procedure for some of the patients that are fairly aggressive in terms of inflammation. And uh, even with a draft three procedure, which is basically uh, removing everything between both sides and opening up the frontal sinuses into one big pathway, uh, this was uh, studied in some uh, populations, especially asthma excipated respiratory disease, the most difficult uh, of sinusitis cases. And even in, in these cases, uh, the polyp recurrence was still high. It was 58%, even with the most aggressive surgery. And revision surgery was required in approximately a quarter of them. So, so uh, Dr. Klaus Bachart and his group actually went a little bit further and did uh, some research on the reboot procedure. So they remove all mucosa from the sinuses and open up the frontal sinuses on both sides and see whether or not that actually helps. And it's fairly aggressive and it might actually lead to scarring, but they showed in their study that the reboot group actually had a much, much less relapse rate and, and recurrence rate versus the non-reboot group. So after surgery, what we do is we continue with medical therapy again, and majority of times we combine uh, nasal steroids with irrigation. And this is actually much better, at least in my experience and in studies as well, uh, to control uh, uh, the symptoms uh, post-surgery, especially with open sinuses all over. And we also sometimes use uh, concentrated uh, ampules of palmocort or uh, fluticasone uh, within the lying head back or the head down forward position. And that actually also increases the permeability of the uh, nasal steroids into the sinuses and leads to a better control in terms of olfaction as well as quality of life. So uh, we've also done studies on the safety of these, uh, this uh, uh, medication, uh, and there was no SPA suppression in the short term. However, in the long term, there was some asymptomatic adrenal suppression within certain groups. Uh, and this is actually within the group of asthmatic patients receiving also inhaled corticosteroids. And this is something that we have to take uh, care about. Uh, this is just a study showing that uh, the uh, intranasal steroid sprays are less and uh, the bidesonide in the lying head back or the vertex to floor position is much more superior in efficacy in controlling the symptoms of sinusitis with polyps patients. So this is just a case uh, that we can show a 36 year old asthmatic who had full FES and uh, failed to control his disease. Unfortunately, he's also asthmatic and is not also well controlled. He has no secondary causes. You can see that the sinuses are fairly open and wide. Uh, but he's still anosmic and he's still uh, looking for more. And that, at this point, we sometimes think about uh, rescue steroids. And, and we always think about the possibility of complications. However, increase the, the, uh, the number of steroid courses more than a course every two years or more than a course per year in, in asthmatic patients or more than a course every six months in asthmatic respiratory disease patients, then the risk of surgery is, uh, is, is much less. And we should probably consider revision surgery. But how much surgery can we do and how many steroid courses uh, do we do at this point? So this is another case that actually had surgery, a uh, 61-year-old, and he has grade three to four polyps on both sides. Asthma is also not controlled. Unfortunately, he cannot undergo surgery and he's actually high risk for a general anesthetic. And he's been on prednisone five milligrams uh, once a day for, for a year or so and completely anosmic. So at this point, I can't even do surgery and what's, what can we do? And this is where the, the treatment paradigm has changed and the, and the introduction of biologics in the last uh, a few years has actually uh, uh, led to a uh, much better control of disease, especially in certain population. And I wouldn't say that the majority of the population is actually controlled with what we mentioned, but probably 5% of the, of the population of all patients will actually need biologics and uh, the ones that are available at this point are Dibilipab for us, uh, Mepilizumab and Omalizumab uh, also are available uh, and mostly by pulmonologists and allergists as well being used. And they, um, I'm sure that uh, a lot of uh, people have talked about them in the few talks before. I'm actually glad to be part of the group uh, in the Gulf, uh, Dr. Prof. Mohamed Awaz as well, uh, in this uh, consensus. Uh, and we actually, uh, 
endorsed the use of the EPOS guidelines within uh, our region and the uh, presence of type 2 inflammation, more than 10 per hydrochlorophyll, the same as we've mentioned, the need for systemic steroids or contraindication systemic steroids, significantly impaired quality of life, and it's not 22 scores, uh, more than 40, and we can actually share with any of you the, uh, the Arabic form for that. Uh, significant loss of smell, and this is a very significant uh, burden on the patient, and the diagnosis of comorbid asthma or even dermatitis. So any type two inflammation. So presence of three or more of these criteria would actually indicate the use of biologics. And multiple phase three trials have been published in the last few years, uh, the Pelumab, Melizumab, Pelizumab, and Beralizumab. And what we've seen in the phase three trials, and there's also recent uh, real world data on the Pelumab in sinusitis with Paul patients, uh, that it does uh, score at the highest in terms of control in the quality of life scores, the symptoms of the VAS scale, and the smell at much uh, better results with it, as well as the rescue steroid and polyp surgeries. And the majority of them are actually safe. I haven't, I haven't my, myself had any issues with it from a safety perspective. And the efficacy on the nasal polyp size uh, as well has been seen to, to be a little bit more superior. Uh, there's also subpopulation analysis on these patients. And what we found is that uh, patients that have had surgery a long time ago, more than 10 years ago, uh, their uh, response to Tepelumab was a little bit less than patients that actually uh, had surgery recently, and it probably relates to the, uh, the technology at that point, possibly less uh, sinuses being opened. And we always uh, still use nasal steroids with Tepelumab, and with unopened sinuses, it might be less efficacious, and this is probably why. Uh, so going back to these cases, uh, so this case actually uh, start, started the Pelumab, and this is what he looked like four months later, and completely clear, he had no issues, his asthma was much, much better and under control, sinuses are all open and doing well, and uh, he's been on it now for a year and a half or so, and he's doing well, we're actually trying to space uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, doses of biologics in these patients and see how far can we go uh, and still control the patients. And same uh, patient, the other patient that we talked about as well, uh, this uh, uh, cardiac patient that cannot undergo uh, general anesthesia again. We started the Belmab as well, and he started smelling, and he actually was uh, very happy with the results. Uh, he did not have any symptoms, and his quality of life much, was much, much better. His asthma which was much, much under control. He actually stopped prednisone which actually led to a lot of issues as well in the cardiac point of view. So it does help in some patients and I'm actually glad as well to be a part of uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, registry form that will hopefully start in the, in the Middle East and the world as well, uh, hopefully be published soon. Uh, and it basically just tries to uh, mon the first enroll the patients as well as monitor the patients after the after uh, dipilumab and see whether or not it actually does have any response. And this is most important to actually see the response within the first three to four months after the surgery itself. So uh, a great study this, to summarize everything that we talked about uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, recently published by Dr. Bachot's group and just to showing the algorithm of how to deal with these patients. And you basically evaluate uh, the sinusitis itself, the symptom severity itself, the comorbidities with the patient, just to see whether or not the type two inflammatory uh, diseases are there, the clinically available biomarkers that we talked about, and initiate the appropriate medical therapy. If that did not resolve the issues, you might consider uh, oral steroids. If it did not improve, then you might consider surgery. And if that was not even controlling the patient themselves, you might consider initiation of biologics and review the response to biologics every few months. So I'd like to thank you uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Zakul, again for the invitation. This is my email for any, any questions and I would like to invite you all for the uh, International Federation of uh, Oloringology Society meeting uh, held in Dubai. Inshallah, in, uh, on the January 2023, which is the largest uh, otolaryngology meeting, uh, Inshallah, in next year. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, an excellent um, and, and very uh, well-timed uh, 
um, lecture. Uh, we have time for some questions if there are any questions in the audience. Sure. Um, uh, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Al Saleh uh, for, for this very interesting talk that helped us understand the, the point of view also of the ENT surgeon, not only the allergist. I, I wonder whether uh, he has any, had any experience with other um, biologics, with the use of other biologics in, uh, apart from Dupix. And, uh, all of us probably have like good experience with Dupinumab and I can say, uh, I, I can like subscribe what you said. Like uh, it's like we, we have a very similar experience but still uh, not a long experience with the other ones. So I just guess if you had a few patients that you want to share. Thank you, that's a, a great question. And uh, uh, what I've, uh, you know, we've had uh, omalizumab for so long and we've tried omalizumab in many patients in the past. And unfortunately it did not really result in a major uh, control of the disease. And this is what we found at least uh, in omalizumab. Uh, Mepilizumab started approximately uh, four or five years ago in the Middle East, and even before that uh, in some other countries. And uh, it still uh, it did not, we, we were not able, and we still are not able to actually prescribe them. Uh, they're actually prescribed by either allergists or pulmonologists. However, what we've noticed is that the control of asthma uh, is much better than the control of sinusitis uh, with mepilizumab. Uh, the Pilumab, however, we've noticed the, uh, I would say, equal or somewhat sometimes a little bit superior to uh, the control of sinusitis, actually superior to con the control of asthma. This is my experience, but however, uh, some people actually in the audience might also disagree as well. Uh, so Bindralazumab, I have no experience with, unfortunately, uh, but the recent uh, trials have not really shown uh, great control uh, of sinusitis patients. And I think, uh, you know, uh, we don't work alone, and this is, I think, this is the, the main theme of the, of, the, uh, of the meeting, is that the multidisciplinary approach to these patients is crucial to see which, uh, which uh, biologics is actually uh, the better choice for each and every patient. Uh, 